In our sermon series on sexuality, we have studied God's design for sexuality from the beginning, as well as looking at how sexuality was corrupted after the fall. And this, our third lesson, we'll explore how our marriages are to reflect the oneness of God. Perhaps one of the most difficult biblical concepts for our frail human minds to understand is the Trinity. Yet it is this oneness of God that gives us a model for how our marriages are supposed to be structured. The world is full of throwaway relationships. We can preach and proclaim all day long about sexual ungodliness, and we should. But what the world really needs is examples of God honoring sexuality. Our friends, our family, our neighbors need to see in our marriages the true nature of God's oneness. So building on this idea, let's explore together how our marriages should reflect the oneness of our triune God. Let's talk about God Three and one, this idea of the Trinity. This idea comes, this idea expresses the thought that God is three. He is tri. He is three persons who come together as one unity. It's tri unity. But really, we see the first glimpse of this in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, where it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. To here at the very beginning, we're seeing God talk about Himself in this plural sense. We also get another glimpse of it in chapter 3. Look at verse 22. Just go one page over. And then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. Again, this, this plural speech that, that is being used. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, in that great proclamation of all Israel, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Yes, He is plural, but He is one. Now, Jesus picks up on this in a conversation in the New Testament. I want to go over there. Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. Look, um, I guess we'll start with verse 28. One of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that he answered them well, seeing that Jesus answered them well. He asked Jesus, what commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and there is no other besides him. And so to say that he is one is to say he's one in unity. And to say He is one is also to say He is the only one. So let us. God is one. And then we see it in Matthew chapter 28. In the baptism of Jesus in Matthew chapter 3 and verses 16 and 17. All three of the, this, the components of the triune God, if I can say it that way, coming together. And at Great Commission, he, he sends out the apostles and he tells us to go about baptizing disciples in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we, we illustrate it with, with a little bit of an illustration like this. I hope that's showing up. Oh, wow, that's big. Uh, <laughs> it's so tiny on my computer screen. <laughs> Sometimes we illustrate it like this. We have the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we want to make sure that we understand that one is not the other. That that they are separate persons within this Trinity. That they are not the same person, but represented in three different ways. That's 
that's oneness theology. It's oneness Pentecostalism. And I think maybe some others teach that as well. What that means is that God is one. He is the Father in the Old Testament. Then in the early New Testament, He decides to come to earth and be like Jesus. And then after that, He decides to be the Holy Spirit. Three. Three separate, but coming together as one. And all three come together as one God. It's a simple illustration to give us this concept. That's a real quick explanation of this. Yeah. Drew's like, you lost me a long time ago. So what's this got to do with our marriages? When the God, husband, and the wife are one. Well, God's divine nature is clearly perceived in the things that he made. Paul, Paul lays this out for us in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. For the invisible attributes, namely God's eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and things that have been made. So the people who deny Him are without excuse. And part of that creation is marriage. We go back to Genesis chapter 2 as we laid out in that very first lesson in this series where God is creating sexuality, He's creating marriage, and He's bringing them together. He says it's good, it's part of His creation, and it demonstrates His divine nature. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24, Moses inserts a commentary there after the creation of the man and the woman. He says, and a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. They shall become one. It's the same concept as God being one. We could add to this Matthew chapter 19 and verse 6 along with Malachi chapter 2 and verses 14 and 15 that, that God enters into this union and He joins a man and a woman together. That's why He says, let not man separate them. So marriage becomes a picture of the Trinity. Three persons coming together as one. God, a man, and a woman. Let's bring our illustration back up. One of these days I'll learn how to use this clicker. What, what do we have? God, a man, and a woman. Now let's put our elements back in. God is not a man. God is not a woman. Man is not God. Woman is not God. A man is not a woman. And a woman is not a man. There are three distinct beings, three distinct persons with their own identities coming together as one. And so what do we see? They're one. Not only do we see this oneness through this illustration of the Trinity, we, we also need to see this oneness in the fact that God becomes one with His people. The relationship of God and His people is often described to us in terms of a marriage. It was like this in the Old Testament. I've got Isaiah 54, 5 there. It's just a really quick verse. There are so many, so many. Uh, but he says, uh, for your maker, for God is your husband, the Lord is His name. You can go over to the little book of Hosea in chapters 1 through 3. That's, that's what that's all about. Hosea takes a wife. She's an adulteress. He puts her away. He brings her back. It's just an image of what God was doing with Israel. He was married to her. She commits adultery through idolatry. He puts her away in the captivity, but then he brings her back. That's just two references. It is everywhere in the Old Testament all over the place. Well, it shouldn't surprise us then when we come to the New Testament, we get the same thing. But instead of it, God and Israel, it's Jesus and the church. Jesus becomes the bridegroom. The church becomes the bride. 
You can find a reference to that in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 15 where Jesus calls himself the bridegroom and then Revelation 19 and 7 where the church is a bride that is being presented to her husband. But then Paul picks up on this concept. So we get the passage from Ephesians 5 that was read for us earlier. Where he begins off with this teaching at the very beginning about the relationship of wives to husbands and husbands to wives. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Just like Christ and the church is one, the marriage relationship of the husband and wife is to reflect that oneness. This mystery. Mystery is just simply something that wasn't known, but now is known. This mystery, I know, he says, it's profound. For I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself. Let the wife see that she respects her husband. So there's oneness in the triune nature of God. These three coming together as one. There's oneness with God and His people. They come together as one. Our marriages are to reflect this oneness. So the question that we all need to answer this morning is, is, is your marriage reflecting the oneness of God? In a minute, in the next point, we're going to talk about homosexuality. Because the argument against homosexuality parlays perfectly into what we're talking about. And I think those that have a biblical understanding of God's desire for a pure sexual life and His, His commandments against homosexuality would say, yeah, a homosexual marriage isn't right. And we would condemn it. But a heterosexual marriage that doesn't reflect the oneness of God is just as wrong. Do you see that? Do, do we understand that? That you might be a man and a woman coming together in the unity of marriage, but if it doesn't reflect the oneness of God, it's just as wrong as anything else. I, I jotted down a few things. I, I'm, I'm really liking Charlie's marriage class. So I went this morning with my own thoughts, but, but I, I sat over there, I sat behind people so I could write and you not look. <laughs> I jotted down a couple of things that, that came to mind. In the Trinity, there's unity. Is there unity in your marriage? Three coming together as one, united together for a common purpose, for a common goal. Do we have that same kind of unity in our marriage? I, I know it. I, I know it can be tough. We we are two totally different creatures. But we have to come together with humility to seek each other's good and have unity in our marriage. Well, what about love? 
just as Christ loved the church and was willing to give himself, willing to die for the church, Paul says, husbands, you need to love your wives in the same way. Be willing to die for them. And I don't know... I know Jesus physically died, and every one of us guys in here might say, yeah, I'd take a bullet for her. Maybe. The biggest place we guys need to die is to die to self. Because it ain't all about me no more. Philippians chapter 2, Paul's writing again. And he begins to talk about this, this nature of Christ. Look at verse 3. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Just look at that again. Husbands, do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count your wife, your children, your family more significant than yourself. Boy, it takes on a different tone, doesn't it? Husbands and wives, verse 4, each of you look not only to your own interest, but to the interest of each other. I want to tell you, we, we want to have a marriage that is God honoring. Then it's about reflecting the oneness of God. The oneness of unity. The oneness of love. How about the oneness of devotion? That we are completely and totally devoted to one another. Sure, on one hand, that means that, that we, we turn a blind eye to any temptation of infidelity. But what it means is, when we are together and we are alone, I want to be totally devoted to my spouse. To listen to her. To love her. To understand her. If she's upset, there's no reason for me to get upset because she's upset. Maybe what I need to do is I need to humble myself and figure out what I did wrong. Or maybe you understand where this is coming from, from something in the past. If we're devoted to our spouse like Christ is devoted to the church, you know what we're not going to do? We're not going to belittle our spouse. We're not going to call them names. We're not going to try to domineer them or beat them up, whether verbally, physically, or mentally. We're going to seek to their good always. And we're going to have intimacy with each other. As I've been working through these lessons, a thought has occurred to me, and and I I don't foresee ever doing this lesson, so you can be like... Look at all the euphemisms that are used in the Bible to describe sexual intercourse. It's kind of interesting. I think there is something to be learned from that. The first act of sexual intercourse is Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1. And Adam knew his wife. He knew her. There's a level of intimacy there. That same kind of verbiage is used to describe the intimacy of the oneness of the triune God. When Jesus says, the Father knows me and I know the Father. There's intimacy. There is a sense in sexual intercourse where we become one physically. That's used. 
But if we want to have the kind of marriage that reflects the oneness of God, then those intimate times should be not to just have mere physical pleasure, but to develop spiritual and soulful oneness together. To know each other. To grow closer together. That's the kind of marriage that will reflect the oneness of God. While we're here, I want to say a word about homosexual marriage. Why homosexuality is not a God-honoring relationship. We, we got into this a little bit in the last lesson. Because there, there are voices among Christian, Christendom, air quotes, that say that this is God-honoring and that it should be changed and that it should be welcomed. I want to talk for just a minute why it's not. First of all, this is a particular sin that has been repeatedly condemned throughout Scripture from the beginning to the end. In Genesis chapter 18, in the time of the patriarchs, we have recorded for us the story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah because of their sexual sinfulness. It was a lush and it was a beautiful place. Now it's a wasteland. In the time of the Mosaic Law in Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 22, just pulled out one reference there, homosexuality is condemned. In the new covenant under Christ, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 9 and 10, homosexuality is condemned. No matter what period you find yourself in, biblically speaking, it is always condemned. And it should remain so even now. But why? Why? Well, first of all, it goes against the natural created order. In Romans chapter 1, Paul, Paul uses this terminology. Look at verse 26. We, we have, we've already gone through the passage uh, one in, in the last lesson, so we're just going to jump into the context. But look at verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passions for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving themselves the due penalty for their error. It is unnatural. It goes against the created order. What is the created order? Well, you go back to Genesis chapter 2 and verses 4 through 25. And there he creates sexuality by creating a man and a woman and uniting the two together in oneness marriage. Anything outside the defined norm is considered sexually immoral. We do not always have to go around defining what is wrong. What is wrong is defined by what is right. But lastly, I want to introduce this idea. I want to go back even before the beginning. Back before Genesis 1-1. When God existed alone. Homosexuality is not God-honoring because it cannot reflect the oneness of God. Let's bring up our diagram again. So what do we put in next? Man is not God, God is not man. And yet the breakers tripped. We do not no longer have three independently defined persons. We now have something that is the same. And so we have to stop here. 
we cannot proceed any further. Because it does not reflect the oneness of God. I don't know about you, but that was profound when I stumbled on that. Because what I really want us to be able to do is move beyond just saying it's wrong because the Bible says it's wrong. I want us to be able to go something deeper, one step further, and explain why the Bible says it's wrong. It goes against the natural created order. The natural created order is to reflect the glory of God, and this cannot reflect His glorious oneness. There's a poem that hangs in our home that I'd like to read for you to close out. I once thought marriage took just two to make a go. But now I'm convinced it takes the Lord also. And not one marriage fails where Christ is asked to enter as lovers come together with Jesus as the center. But marriage seldom thrives and homes are incomplete till he is welcome there to help avoid defeat. In homes where Christ is first, it's obvious to see those unions really work for marriage takes three. go back here to the classroom where Charlie's teaching his marriage class this quarter it says up on the top of the board we want to have marriages that proclaim the glory of God how do we do that we recognize this oneness this unity this love this devotion this intimacy that God has among Himself and among His people. And we show that in our marriages to one another and to the world. If we do that, can I insert a new term here? Then we'll have a scriptural marriage. And we'll display the true sexuality that God intended. Derek has a song of encouragement and invitation for us. Come to Jesus. Can we help you with a spiritual need this morning? Whatever it may be. Won't you come while together we stand and sing.